Hello, Creepy Puppets Presents here. I've decided to do a uh, dramatic reading of the paper that I was supposed to present at LIPS 2020 before it got cancelled, and we all know the reason it was cancelled. So, uh, without much more ado, I present to you Pseudo! Evidence for the Social Construction of Demarcation by Thomas A. O'Rourke, M.S. Part 1. Abstract. Demarcation, the distinction between science and pseudoscience, is a long-standing issue in science and the philosophy of science. This paper considers the proposed methods of demarcation from the literature and ultimately finds them unsatisfying. Paul Feyerabend's critique is then explored, and this paper advances the hypothesis that demarcation is a social construction. Empirical evidence for the social construction hypothesis was developed by a meta-study of the scientific literature purporting to debunk astrology. This study is still ongoing. Only four studies of sufficient quality have been found thus far. Of these, only two were a genuine investigation into astrological claims, and even these studies contained evidence of bias. Astrology is far from having been debunked, this study provides compelling evidence of social construction of demarcation. The real part one, introduction. A portion of scientists are vocal about the importance of distinguishing science from pseudoscience, broad 1979. These scientists claim pseudoscience has negative externalities in policy, etc. Hansen, 2018. Rather than merely evaluating the truth or falsehood of claims, it is proposed that certain propositions may be included in a privileged class of claims, quote, science, while other propositions are members of a set of claims that can be dismissed out of hand, a set called, quote, pseudoscience. If this distinction is based on purely social factors, social constructionism, then there is always a risk that such a distinction is arbitrary. True statements may be discounted out of hand, while false statements may be elevated to, quote, scientific truth, unquote. More importantly, if it is generally believed that pseudoscientific beliefs create social harm, Hansen 2018, then those who hold pseudoscientific beliefs may be discriminated against, the heretics of the new age. If there is a non-social criterion, besides truth or falsehood, demarcating pseudoscience, what is that criterion? Such a criterion would have to map to our intuitions about what is pseudoscientific and what is scientific. If the criterion puts a claim generally accepted as pseudoscience, e.g. creationism, into the science category, or vice versa, the criterion should be discounted. Moreover, criteria leading to fallacious reasoning should be dis discounted. What fields of discourse are potential candidates for pseudoscience? Such fields should not come from other disciplines which do not claim to be science, like the humanities, or mathematics. Such fields shouldn't be religions that might have a scientific trapping like Scientology or Christian science, as despite the names, these are truly religions. There is, of course, overlap in these categories. Uh, creationism claims to be science, despite being of religious origin. And there are religious interpretations of astrology. See Zoller, 1980, Greer and Warnock, 2010. Pseudoscience is not also what we call pathological science, Rousseau, 1992, or scientific fraud, though pseudoscience may possibly involve both. Examples of purported pseudoscientific beliefs are climate change skepticism, Wirt, 2011, creationism, Coin, 2001, and homeopathy, Rousseau, 1992. Part 2. The Demarcation Criteria. These are criteria of demarcation that have been proposed. Part A of 2. Demarcation criteria exist along a spectrum, from strictly non-social criteria to purely social criteria. Verification among the most non-social is the old standby of the positivist, see Popper, 1963. To be a scientific claim, at the very least, the claim must have some way of being checked. There are several problems with this view. Consider a theoretical epidemiological study of a zombie apocalypse. Such studies have in fact been published. For example, Varen et al. 2014. 
this model would be impossible to verify, as a zombie apocalypse seems quite fantastical. But such a study seems intuitively scientific. It also seems that allegedly pseudoscientific claims could be verifiable. The existence of Bigfoot, for example, is in principle verifiable. The existence of the afterlife, if it is true, will be personally verified by each of us. A final problem was raised by Karl Popper, 1963. Evidence may be interpreted as verification by proponents even if it really isn't. Popper gives the example of a Marxist that sees a lack of media coverage of the growing workers' revolution as verifying his theory that the corporate media is suppressing evidence of a growing workers' revolution. Karl Popper, 1963, proposes instead that the scientific claim is necessarily falsifiable. Popper's Marxist must state the conditions under which his belief could be tested and falsified. Confirmation is logically inductive. Finding evidence for a claim does not guarantee that the claim is true, but if a claim implies some consequence, and the consequence is falsified, then the claim can be deductively proven false. However, claims are rarely held alone. Hypotheses are complex conjunctions of claims. For example, that my instruments are reliable. And denying the consequence could invalidate the claims in the conjunction, i.e. that uh, my instruments are not reliable. Logical problems aside, though, there are claims generally accepted to be scientific that cannot be falsified. The zombie apocalypse case is one such case, but so could the claim that alien life exists out there in the universe. It's not possible to check that claim or falsify it, but general understanding of chemistry, statistics, and the size of the universe makes the claim intuitively plausible and scientific. It may be objected that alien life might eventually be verified or falsified if faster than light travel is discovered, but consider the existence of the multiverse, which I take to not be principally verifiable or falsifiable, but is a logical consequence of, uh, for example, the highly scientific string theory. The opposite problem is also true. Alleged pseudoscientific claims can be falsified. Uh, suppose a Bigfoot proponent with some scientific training wants to test a Bigfoot claim in a falsifiable way. To this end, my Bigfoot researcher proposes a habitat distribution study to evaluate whether a population of large primates could be supported in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, thus, the plausibility of the Bigfoot claim could itself be falsified. Part 2b, Progressiveness and Community Approaches. It has been proposed by Taggart, 1978, that science distinguishes itself from pseudoscience by the behavior of its community. Science seeks to progress, while pseudoscience does not seek to advance or change in the light of new evidence, and the scientific community tends to be rigorous in its thinking. Pseudo-scientific communities may embrace conspiratorial thinking to explain why their ideas have not been accepted by the scientific establishment. An important clarification must be made here. The community approach is not a form of social constructionism, in that the demarcation is not determined by the community. Rather, demarcation is here determined by facts about the community. The most obvious problem with this is that it's dangerously close to the genetic fallacy. Ideas are not valued on their own merits, but rather where they come from. As a related objection, scientific ideas often come from non-scientific communities. For example, the use of non-organic chemicals as medicine was pioneered by a physician, astrologer, and alchemist Paracelsus, Borzelica 2000. Thirdly, the scientific community itself is not free from scientific fraud or pathological practices. See Rousseau, 1992. The problems of p-hacking, Simmons et al. 2013, and the lack of replication studies, Munafo et al. 2017, still affect the scientific community. Fourthly, it may be asked why progressiveness is valuable in and of itself. In the discipline of mathematics, a proven theorem does not need repeated progression. Uh, true, this is due to the a priori nature of mathematical truth, but the progressiveness of science might be viewed as a mark of science's inferiority to mathematics. Finally, the prospect of community reform raises the specter of moving a community from pseudoscientific to scientific, 
uh, as is the case in the habitat distribution analysis used by cryptozoologists that I proposed earlier. A quick interlude here. This isn't in the paper, but I have learned it subsequently. Uh, there have been habitat distribution studies looking into uh, Bigfoot, and I will talk about that at some time in the future. All right, part 2C, metaphysical approaches. Science is in the habit of practicing methodological naturalism. Metaphysical materialism is assumed to be true for the purpose of science. If this is a habit of science, then perhaps theories which embrace views differing from naturalism are pseudoscientific. A similar stance was adopted in the legal decision of Kitzmiller v. Dover, 2005. This is a partial demarcation criterion. It has nothing to say, for example, about completely materialistic theories that might be pseudoscientific, like cryptozoology. There are two problems with this criterion. Firstly, consider the Hindu monk. The Hindu monk argues that the material world is an illusion, but he accepts that the content of that illusion is what science says it is. Compare this to the creationist, who accepts the material reality of the world, while simultaneously arguing that the world is 6,000 years old. The wholly anti-materialist position is closer to scientific orthodoxy than the at least dualistic creationist position. Secondly, the criterion invokes the logical fallacy of question begging. Why is methodological naturalism the proper basis of science? Why not methodological skepticism or some other methodological epistemological position? Part 2D, instrumentalist theories. If scientific theories are viewed pragmatically, that true scientific theories are the most useful, one might think that pseudoscientific theories may be defined as those theories which are less useful than currently the most useful theories. On this view, the theory of evolution is scientific because it is the most useful theory, while creationism is pseudoscientific because it is less useful in making predictions. The problem with this account is that usefulness is contextual. It may be generally said that heliocentrism is more useful than geocentrism. Uh, under this framework, heliocentrism is science and geocentrism is pseudoscience. So far, so good. Now suppose a man is lost at sea. To work out his position, he builds a makeshift sextant and takes the zenith height of the sun at astronomical noon. Unless it happens to be the equinox, he will need to work out the declination of the sun compared to his position in order to complete his calculations. The math for calculating declination is the same on the heliocentric model as the geocentric model, but the math was worked out while the geocentric model was still dominant. And to do his calculation, our sailor imagines the course of the sun revolving around the earth. Imagining the earth around the sun makes the calculation too difficult for the sailor to work out conceptually uh, from first principles. Functionally, geocentrism is the more useful theory under this circumstance. Geocentrism may be fairly said to be promoted to science, while heliocentrism is demoted to pseudoscience in this context. Part 2e, socially constructed theories. If objective accounts of demarcation have failed, it follows that social constructionist theories of demarcation remain. Why should a society with the power to define heresy not declare their opposition heretical? Part 3. Feyerabend's Critique of Demarcation The eminent anarchist and philosopher of science, Paul Feyerabend, is critical of the very notion of demarcation. Science, Feyerabend argues, proceeds not according to rigorous method, but through radical breaks with the established order. Science is a game to be won. Galileo won people to his cause because he exaggerated some of his results, and through his personal charisma. See Broad, 1979. Feyerabend believes that the danger of the pseudoscience as heresy idea is doubly dangerous as big science has ingratiated itself uh, to big business, broad 1979, and big government policy, Hansen 2018. If Feyerabend is right about the political and scientific implications of demarcation, and demarcation is mostly arbitrary, demarcation should be done away with. Part 4 an empirical study of social construction in the scientific investigation of astrology. 
if the demarcation of science and pseudoscience is socially constructed, it ought to be possible to find evidence of this in scientific literature. If classifying a field as pseudoscientific were purely a matter of the truth of the claim, then any study purporting to refute the claims of a pseudoscientific field should not differ in form from refuting a claim in a scientific field. Firstly, the investigation should be in good faith. Researchers should not hold initially negative positions toward the subject matter. The investigator should not presume duplicitousness on the part of the claimants. Secondly, the investigation should hold the same standards as would be expected in science. It would be inappropriate to hold a purportedly pseudoscientific claim to a greater or lesser standard of rigor than a scientific claim. Thirdly, the investigation should be free from logical fallacies. Among these, it should refrain from committing a straw man fallacy by not consulting the literature of the purported pseudoscience. Fourthly, the investigation should not interpret results in ways unnecessarily uncharitable to the claim. Part 5. Astrology Astrology is a set of claims that hold the relative motion of the planets against the background of the stars corresponds to cycles of the human domain, including health, psychological profile, uh, and political circumstances, inter alia. Historically, the foundation of astrological belief was that the movement of the planets corresponded to the seven spiritual forces that affect human affairs, Zolar 1980. One should conduct a war, for example, when the spiritual forces of war, ruled by Mars, were strong. One should marry when the spiritual forces of love, Venus, were strong, and so on. If a person needed to be married or go to war when the spiritual forces of war or love were weak, magicians would make talismans to capture the desired spiritual forces when they were strong. Astrology, however, can be placed into an entirely materialist context. It may be that astrology was a primitive form of statistics. If one were in the habit of observing natural cycles, e.g. the flooding of the Nile, and timing these cycles according to the position of the planets, the only real calendar system of the ancient world, then one might start looking in uh, other events, like political cycles, and trying to time them according to the planets. So, for example, Saturn is associated with change and destruction, and it is said to be the strongest when it's in Capricorn. If an astrologer claims that social change is likely to happen when Saturn is in Capricorn, is that social change due to spiritual forces, or is that change due to the 30 years, roughly two generations, especially in the Middle Ages, that it takes for Saturn to go from Capricorn back to Capricorn? And social change is likely to occur after two generations have passed. There is also the observed phenomena of health being tied to the seasons of one's birth, See Gary et al. 2013. This hypothesis would also explain why different systems of astrology, e.g. Western versus Chinese, with different interpretations of astrological events, could both have validity, because these traditions would have timed events into their own paradigm. In the history of Western astrology, astrology fell out of practice during the Enlightenment, only to be revived in the late 19th century, Solar 1980. If the original context had been lost, the new tradition would indeed be less accurate, and is generally perceived to be less accurate by certain segments of the astrological community, Zola 1980. In this paper, the Western tradition, that is, European and Islamic astrology, will be the focus. The general idea is that each of the seven classical planets, the Sun, the Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, has a character and dominion all on its own, Greer and Warnock 2010. Each of the signs, which are 30-degree divisions of the ecliptic named for the constellations, they were nearest 2,000 years ago, not the constellation themselves, uh, also has its character that either works synergistically or antagonistically with the planets. When a planet is in a particular sign, the strength of the planet, the essential dignity, will depend on how well the character of the sign and the character of the planet interact. Planets can also interact with each other based on their character of the angles between them. This is known as the accidental dignity of the planet, see Greer and Warnock 2010. One takes the position of the planets at a given time and a given location and computes the relative strengths and weaknesses of each planet, the debility or dignity, uh, from a table. If Mars is strong, the lore goes, it is a good time to go to war. 
Further interpretation is done through the house system. A sign at or just below the eastern horizon is the first house, also called the ascendant. Houses 2 through 12 are numbered below the horizon counterclockwise. Each house is thought to govern a specific area of life. For example, the second house govern one's own personal finances. The character of the planets in that sign, or the strength of the planet associated with the sign, determine the quality of one's personal finances. An important distinction must be made here. The 19th century revival of astrology was psychological in nature, and is reckoned from the sign containing the sun, hence the term sun sign astrology, Zoller 1980. Traditional Western astrology was practical in nature, and was reckoned from the sign of the first house, ascendant sign astrology. As an illustration of the difference between the psychological and practical approaches, traditional astrology regards the fourth house as concerning one's inheritance, while new Western astrology interprets this as one's psychological foundation. Uh, my sun sign is Aquarius, while my ascendant sign is Scorpio. According to modern astrology, my base personality is spiritual, while the traditional method would say that my base personality is aggressive and ambitious, but because Mars is weak in my horoscope, these character traits tend to not overwhelm other characteristics. Uh, the traditional method would also hold that I am likely to be spiritual, but the sun being weak, spirituality would only make a small part of my personality. Uh, it seems prima facie that the traditional method is wildly different in interpretation and content. Part 6 Abstracts using Google Scholar and Web of Science under the keywords astrology, astrology science, astrology pseudoscience, astrology debunked, and astrology refuted uh, were collected. When time preferences were available, as they are in Google Scholar, each phrase was searched without time preference and again with a time preference of 2015 or more recent. Abstracts were taken from the first 20 pages of the results on each term. Abstracts which describe the history of astrology, the sociology of astrology, the philosophy of science discussing astrology, and the reasons why people might believe in astrology were discounted. Only studies which claimed to refute astrology were considered. This study is still ongoing. Hitherto, four studies were found which met the search criteria and purportedly refuted the claims of astrology. So, part seven, the studies. McGrew and McFall, 1990, asked six astrologers to match the personality profiles of 23 volunteers with their natal horoscopes. The astrologers did not do better than chance, or better than a control group of non-astrologers asked to do the same task. Astrologers were members of the Indiana Federation of Astrologers. Personality profiles were from the Strong Campbell Vocational Interest Blank and the Cattell 16 PF Personality Inventory. I may have butchered those. Henningsen and Henningsen tested astrology's compatibility in marriage by asking 56 couples to give their date of birth. A sun sign was then calculated for each, and astrological compatibility was computed from www.astrology.com. Marital satisfaction was measured according to a six-point test. Belief in astrology was controlled for. The authors found that the results were inconclusive. Carlson, 1985, is regarded as a landmark refutation of astrology. Ertel, 2009. In this study, 283 subjects provided information sufficient to work out horoscopes and a California Personality Index, CPI, profile. 28 astrologers were invited to consult in the drafting of the horoscopes, which were drafted via computer. Subjects were asked to evaluate three horoscopes, one of which was genuine, and choose which of the horoscopes were there. They were not able to do this better than chance. A control group was asked to choose their own CPI profile from a pool of one genuine and two bogus CPI profiles. This group was also no better than chance. Finally, astrologers, were asked to match a horoscope to a person from a pool of one genuine horoscope and two bogus ones. The astrologers were no better than chance. 
The Carlson experiment was replicated by Wyman and Vise in 2010 using the five-point test and horoscopes drawn on an automated astrology software. The subjects were able to distinguish the five-point test at a rate greater than chance, while horoscopes were not able to be distinguished greater than chance. However, subjects were only given two choices, while Carlson subjects were given three, as the prediction of horoscope accuracy in the Carlson study was 50%. The statistical methods of Carlson have been criticized by Airtel 2009. Carlson originally wanted a confidence interval of four standard deviations, but only got a confidence interval of 2.5. Conclusions While the present study is still ongoing, those studies that met the criteria were all tests of either sun sign astrology or do not specify what kind of astrology they perform. While Carlson, 1985, did at least inquire of astrologers, it is not clear what methods these astrologers used to generate their predictions. Carlson, a physicist, did not bother to teach himself astrology, which I did, courtesy of Zoller, 1980, and Greer and Warnock, 2010, so he lacks a basis to criticize the information provided to him. Aside from the lack of transparency in methodology and an unwillingness on the part of the researchers to cultivate any independent expertise in astrology, which led them to test what reliable astrological sources Zoller, Greer, and Warnock regard as inferior systems of astrology, Carlson, 1985, and McGrew and McFall, 1990, test astrology through its practitioners, which may well be a fair tactic for exposing a fake psychic but is wholly unorthopractic in science. If one science suspected another of fraud, they would try to expose that fraud through replication of the experiment, not through testing the allegedly fraudulent scientist's bench skills. These authors seem to view astrologers akin to fraudulent psychics, which suggests a certain lack of good faith. Finally, despite statistically shaky conclusions and absurdly high confidence interval, Airtel 2009 notes that Carlson is regarded as a devastating test of astrology, despite the astrology being no more accurate than the well-known CPI. Why not interpret Carlson's results as astrology just as accurate as established psychological test, CPI? If one wanted to remain unfair to astrology, why not title your paper CPI no more accurate than astrology? These studies, as few as there are, exhibit bad faith, a lack of critical research and expertise on the part of the investigators, a straw man of astrological views as a consequence of the lack of research, a lack of transparency so that the work of the astrologers could be checked by other astrologers, double standards regarding both attitudes toward the astrologers and statistical confidence, and a method of interpretation of results designed to give astrology the least charitable reading possible. So far, these results strongly point toward the social construction hypothesis. These conclusions are consistent with Hergovich et al. 2010, who found that when abstracts for identical experiments with different conclusions were submitted for peer review, any abstract showing a statistically significant result supporting astrology was less likely to be read, recommended for publication, and even had the reviewer's name attached as the reviewers were more likely to ask to have their names re removed from the review. On the whole, it seems that scientists view astrology as not being worth their time, and as a consequence, studies attempting to refute astrology are few and of very poor quality. Even if one found some support for astrology, it probably wouldn't get published. Despite this, the narrative arising from biased interpretations is that astrology has been refuted, and so scientists do not consider astrology to be worth their time. The circle continues, quod erat demonstrandum. Thank you for listening to my reading. Uh, take care, folks.